it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Jason Campbell, who lives right up the street from me, about what, three hours to two, Pres- two hours to Prescott? Two. So we're down here in the Phoenix uh, desert, and what's so cool is um, Arizona, you um, drive north, and is Prescott right above the Mungian Rim? It, uh, just west and slightly south. Of the Mungian Rim? Uh-huh. So what's the elevation up there? We're about 55. And what's Flagstaff? Uh-huh. Uh, they're about seven. It's so cool because in the summer, um, you know, you can drive it to Flagstaff, and I mean, it's like it's just it's just gorgeous weather. I love it up there. Uh, not to be rude, I don't know if I'd want to go back to shoveling snow. I grew up in Wichita, <laughs> went to Creighton in Omaha, yeah. and Dental School. The thing about Creighton is three years without a car, right? And then Dental School, I lived eight blocks away, didn't have a car till senior year. Ouch! So me and my roomies, we had to walk eight blocks to Dental School, and when and if we had a test, we had to get there early because our hands were so cold, right? You couldn't write fast on an essay test, so we'd get there you know, ten minutes early and warm up our hands so that we could <laughs> obviously uphill both ways. But it, right. but it probably wouldn't be so bad to. Live in the snow if you had money but you know the in a garage and a car with a heater interesting about press interesting thing about prescott is that we don't get a lot of snow we we have four seasons but it'll snow and within a day or two it melts so we're kind of in that perfect banana belt zone where you know we don't get the snow like flagstaff is we don't get the extreme heat that phoenix gets we're usually about 10 degrees cooler than phoenix and about 10 degrees warmer than flagstaff it's just kind of like this beautiful why it's such a popular place for people to retire to. Now, Awatuki just got four seasons this year. For the first time? Yeah, they built a hotel right on the Elliott exit, and uh, I was so excited <laughs> we finally get all four seasons. Uh, so basically, Jason C. Campbell, what's the C for? Uh, Clay. Clay. I don't tell that to very many people. Jason C. I, I figured a, um, um, it would have been Christopher. I don't know why. Jason, yeah. Chris, Jason Clay Campbell is a founder, clinical director, of the Advanced Prosthetics Institute, Center for Biofunctional Practice and Philosophy. It is the dental education center for enhancing clinical skills by demystifying the complexities of advanced dental care services, including dental surgery, implant training, and treatment of biofunctional disorders. He is the pioneer of the biofunctional philosophy taught at API and is a national implant and surgical prosthetics lecturer. Dr. Campbell is also an associate partner with Dr. Mark Costas, who's been on the show with his dental Success Institute and has joined the growing dental success network as a faculty member. His fee for service general dentist practice focuses on the treatment of complex care issues, including reconstruction of patients faced with dental demise, terminal dentition, TMJD, chronic facial pain and headaches, and oral and systemic issues of acidity and inflammation. Over the years, Dr. Campbell has completed extensive advanced training in surgical prosthetics through the USC School of Prosthodontics, Periodontics and Oral Surgery, continuing education programs. He obtained his DDS degree magnum cum laude at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Upon graduation, he was a recipient of the Dentist Blycock Award for Excellence in Prosthodontics. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Howard, it's awesome to be here. Oh, it's a man. milestone for me to be able to sit here with you and be able to just visit. Oh, well, <laughs> the, the honor is all mine. Um, gosh darn. So I, I know the first thing my homies are thinking is um, they probably never even heard of biofunctional. It's the biggest challenge that I face because it's a principle that that's uncommon in the world of dentistry, but it's a problem that faces just thousands and thousands of people. And in dentistry, we're doing a great job at understanding the, the uh, biomechanics side of things, but we're not really understanding the biology of some of these complex dental issues. And so, you know, biofunction is a term that we use to describe human biology and the effects that it can have in the oral cavity. And uh, the functionality of the way the jaws, teeth, and musculature interact. And sometimes when there's crossover of these two events, it, it just creates devastating effects in people's mouths. If we can catch it earlier, intervene earlier, we can stop these patients that end up in late stage terminal dentition or dental demise that are refi- you know, they're requiring these full mouth rehabs or they're requiring you know, surgical reconstruction of their entire dentition. And it's just so problematic. And, and uh, what we've learned over time is it's a great target area for somebody who's looking to build their practice in really any type of dentistry. You know, so really, bio, biofunction is biology and the functionality, biology of the system, bi, uh, functionality of the jaws, and the problems that arise when there's overlapping conditions. 
So um, it's so interesting to me, guy, like because you still got so many dentists that do new patient cleanings. Yeah. And I mean, they, they you know, where, how, where do you get a complete exam there? And then there's a whole nother um, group where, you know, a healthy functional animal has empathy and sympathy. Right. So that they, they feel, they're, they're not gonna tell you have 11 cavities. Right. Uh, they have all these disease. So that they, they just pick the one that's worth, they do one tooth. Right. And then after maybe five or 10 years, they say, well, you know, if I'm gonna be numbing up this, this whole area anyway, why don't we just do this whole quadrant? And so the, they eventually get to one quadrant dentistry. How do you get dentists to go to complete exams and complete dentistry? Yeah. I mean, with, I, mean yeah. You, I, I don't even know if you were doing that straight out of school. Where, yeah. where, where in your journey did you go from knee patient cleanings and one tooth dentistry to complete dentistry? You know, it's a, I never ever had that approach to new patient cleanings. Uh, you know, my, my approach to care has always been kind of from that standpoint. So my philosophy is, actually, actually you know, Howard, the, the, the big thing that we're faced with is that most of our education is gearing us towards finding problems so that we can support the practice and support ourselves. But what we really were trained for is to become diagnosticians first and then delegate care to the appropriate, you know, to the appropriate people that should be involved in that care. So my philosophy from the onset of practice was patients always see the person who's gonna diagnose the problems first. Identify the problems, develop the care plan, educate the patient on what they are, and then uh, delegate to the appropriate staff to implement you know, the care plan. So program. identify problem, mm -hmm. plan. So you're gonna identify the problem, educate the patient, Establish a care plan. I like that, a care plan instead of a treatment plan. Yeah. And care then, plan. And then delegate treatment to appropriate care providers. Well, you know, if you want to be a lawyer instead of a dentist, um, they, they break the law when they do a new patient cleaning. Yeah. Because the, the hygienist sees them and they start taking an x-ray, well, she can't make a diagnosis that they need x-rays. Exactly. And then starts doing a cleaning, well, she can't do a cleaning without a diagnosis. And I was very upset last time, one of my boys, he, he thought he had a bump or something down there. And I said, um, and it was hurting and it's been about three days. So I said, well, let's just go to the emergency room and check it out. Lady took him back there and did a uh, CAT scan. He, he's a boy, that's his genitalia down there, all right. that radiation. Boy, the doctor came in, he said, what the hell did you do that? And she says, we, we take CAT scans on all areas concerned. He goes, you just re radiated his gonads for a little fat lipid. <laughs> and I'm like, and, and, and then when you got the bill, guess yeah. how much that CAT scan costs? Yeah. Yes. Oh, a lot. 6,500. Yeah. I've, I've oh been through that God. process. In fact, so, I've been so, through it recently. So, so identify problem. How do you, um, you know, we got two dental schools in here, yeah. Midwestern and um, AT Steel and God dang, they're so young. I mean, you go in there. That's why I call them dental kindergarten. I mean, trust me, <laughs> you think you're all out of bag chips. When you're 55 and you're in dental school, you, you look like you're in kindergarten. I mean, th right. them are babies. Yeah. And they're so sweet and they're so nice. They have so much empathy. They just, they just have a hard time telling you that you have all these problems. Yeah. How, how, do, how do you get over But I wouldn't want to go to a doctor and him thinking, well, I can't tell him he's got <laughs> prostate cancer and diabetes. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd want to know right. the whole picture. How, how do you get them over that hill? So, you know, honest, I've got to be, just get to the point. When I, when I interact with dentists and I start to discuss with them, okay, if I ask the dentist, what is it that you're fighting as a dentist? Mo most dentists can't tell me. They'll say, well, I do root canals and I do orthodontics and I do this and I do that. But if you could develop and just narrow it down to help our, our clinical care providers understand what we're really trying to fight. I, it's my opinion, and, and maybe it's just an opinion, but you know, if, if people feel otherwise, I'd be happy to know, but essentially there's three things that are creating 99% of all dental problems. And if we just spend our time treating those three things and helping people to avoid them, we can stop most dental issues. It's a controllable disease, right? The first is jaw biomechanic and force distribution problems. Say that again. Jaw biomechanics issues and force distribution problems. So, you know, your, your jaws, they generate a lot of energy. That energy's gotta go somewhere. So if the biomechanics of jaw functions isn't in harmony, it creates wear and tear of teeth, wear and tear of joints, 
creates muscle muscle deficiency, muscle injury, so, muscle so you're, talking about, so you're talking about occlusal disease. Occlusal disease, yeah. Yeah. The and forces that and then the other two are what? The other two are systemic and oral acidity. Acid's the only thing that causes tooth decay. And the sources of that acid come from a lot of different areas. The last is inflammation. You know, we talk about periodontal disease, and if you ask a dentist, you know, what causes periodontal disease? Uh, bacteria, uh, people don't brush their teeth. The bottom line is, is periodontal disease is the end result of inflammation. The bacteria may trigger it, but bacteria aren't the only trigger of inflammation in the periodontium or in the bone. You know, gingivitis is inflammation in your gum tissue. Periodontitis is the end result of inflammation in the bone. So if we really start to target like those three areas, we can get to the sources that are that are initiating them. For, for example, acid, right? We're really good at telling people to brush their teeth. And what we're trying to do is eliminate sugars that are converted to acid by bacteria in the mouth. We are pretty good about, you know, we, we have the diagnosis Mountain Dew carries, so we're good about telling people about acidic, acidic products that they may eat. Did eat you watch that video on why Mountain Dew is so much more, uh, causes so much more acid? I don't know if I know the one you're specifically talking about, but um, I never really got that until um, someone mailed a YouTube video. This this guy explained why Mountain Dew is uniquely different, and I don't know if Tom may I can. Can I you find that I video? Saw it. I would love to. Uh, I would the love YouTube to video, but um, but yeah, there, it was. Uh, it just blew my mind. I was like, oh yeah, of course I can't remember because I'm senile. And after I, after I leave here today, I'll look it up. <laughs> no, I'll email to you. Oh, that would be awesome. But, yeah, but Mountain Dew is incredibly yeah. more acidic for a very yeah um, exactly. Hey, you know, but, you, but anyway, you uh, think about any of those: coffee, tea, soda pop, citric fruits and juices, sports drinks, energy drinks have become a real problem for younger generations because they're so acidic, so sugary, and you know. So that's a source of acid in the mouth. And sugar is now um, a, a cause of inflammation. It is a conflammation. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the, the and just sugar just alone causes inflammation. Well, let's look at it like this, Howard. So we've targeted these oral sources of, of acid, but one of the areas that we just don't know enough about is what about the digestive system? People who have a tendency towards heartburn or acid reflux or GERD or irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease, any of those things that disrupt digestion increase oral acidity. So you have these uh, phantom patients in your practice that come in, they're brushing their teeth 50,000 times a day, they come and see it every three months for their cleanings and their fluoride treatments, yet every time they come they have dental restorations that are failing, they have rampant tooth decay problems, they're getting cavities below the gum line or in odd areas that you wouldn't typically see. If we just make that link and we consider the source of the acid and we begin trying to treat the source of the acid, we can eliminate this, this problem for these people that have rampant tooth decay. You know, you have, you have medically induced But trauma. everyone drinks coffee, tea, and soda in America. I mean, what percent what of America sure. lives off one of those three? Yeah, no, 100%, and I agree. Yeah. But when it comes to acidity, it's a time exposure problem. Right, are exposed to an acidic environment. The acid eats the minerals out of the teeth, thins the enamel, weakens the enamel. Usually effects of acidity, except especially if it's coming from a systemic source, like a digestive problem, um, it, alters, it alters the metabolics of your body system. It can acidify your saliva. Your saliva now becomes an acidic byproduct, and it's constantly just eating the minerals out of your teeth. So protocols to avoid that you know I don't know why my grandparents knew about it but it seems to be something that's been lost over time which is just simply having your patients use a product with baking soda in it something that can help neutralize the oral environment could make a big difference whether it be baking soda toothpaste baking soda rinses so if we have a patient who has a high caries rate because they have multiple sources of acidity, my recommendations to them would be, okay, if you're going to have a, you know, when you're drinking coffee, are you drinking a cup or are you drinking a pot? Are you getting a 44 ounce, you know, mocha java latte from, from uh, Starbucks or are you brewing, you know, a small cup at home? 
But my recommendation would be to them is if you can limit the time that it's taking you to do that, I would be happier if they injected it intravenously if that's what they really needed than to expose their teeth to that acid for a long period of time. Does that also include using a straw? Well, a straw is still going to increase oral acidity, but it doesn't really matter. The fact that the acid's there isn't as big as a deal as the time frame that it's exposed to. You know, the trick um, for me and uh, a couple of my friends to quit drinking so much coffee is get rid of the creamer. Yeah. Because when you get rid of the creamer, coffee is not that good. <laughs> it doesn't taste that good. And after a cup, you start getting gut rot. Yeah. But for some reason, if you put in um, half and half milk or French milk, oh, so you found it. Put in your uh, cell phone and your email, and then I'll uh, text you that Mountain Dew video. But it, it was a mind-blowing video. I can't remember. I'll, I'll have to watch it um, afterwards. Yeah, we're, we're dinosaurs. There's been uh, seven new dental schools. Uh, the last seven dental schools were all DMD. There will never be another DDS dental school. But I think it's a, uh, I think it's a bad idea because there's, um, I live down here in Phoenix, and I always hear people say, well, you know, I used to go to an, an, a, a DO, but my husband told me you need to go start seeing an MD. And then this last dentist, he did this, it didn't work. But he, he, he was a DMD, and the guy in Iowa was a DDS. That's why I picked you. And I'm like, that's, I mean, there's a difference. I mean, there's no difference to the consumer between a DMD and a DDS. Right. So it's, it's confusing. It is a little confusing. And I, I think dentists, if, if they either need to, should just do a coin toss. <laughs> Who cares? Or, or at least give the dentist the permission to, to market decide. DMD or DDS. Because yeah. if, you're an, if you're an East Coast DMD guy and you go to Kansas or Arizona, it confuses the market. It really does kind of confuse me. And if a DDS guy goes to New Jersey, they're like, what is a DDS? Yeah. And um, See, you're thinking like a guy with an online presence, though, where your message has an outreach. You know what's funny about that? So many people tell me um, they don't like it when I'm posting tennis articles, whatever, I call them Dr. Um, Jason Campbell DDS. They go, if you have the DDS after the name, you don't put a doctor before. And I'm like, oh... How mighty American of you. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> Very do you know what a BDS correct. is? Do you know what the dental degrees are all around the world? You know, in the Middle East, it's cultural to put, whether you're a man or a woman, Mr. Professor this or Miss Professor this. So the bottom line is when you get direct mail from some real estate agent has got a bunch of alphabet suit behind their name, you don't know what that means. Yeah. Well, you might know what that means in America because you're an American and you have an American dental degree. But when you go around the world, they want to know right up front, is this a doctor or not? Right. And, and if you're Brazil, it's a DRE, Dre for a boy, draw for a girl. But mm -hmm. you got we put that up front just so their, their mind, their walnut brain knows immediately this is a dentist, you know, and then the alphabet soup. Yeah. Um, I guarantee I can show you 20 countries, dental initials after their name, and you can't even tell me what they stand for. You know, so it's different. And I, I don't think the community generally knows anyways. I think what and they're that, looking for is legitimacy, credentialing. If you see a few letters behind the name, that's got to mean something. I don't know what it is, but it must be important. So it flips a switch on in their brain, and they start thinking in those terms. But so so um, you're in um, Prescott, 50,000 people. What percent of them do you think um, drink coffee, tea, sports drink, soda, and are running too acidic? And, and what is... What do you do for those people? Well, what percent of them? Almost everybody does, but as part of our education program, it's I don't I don't care that they're drinking it, but what concerns me is time exposure. If they have an elevated risk for tooth decay or you know premature failure of their dental work, all I want to do is mitigate the factors that are adding to it. So, we're going to go through an analysis. I'm going to ask them about their home care. What are we doing? Are we brushing? Are we flossing? What products are you using? So something as simple as advising them how to use their toothpaste products could be hugely beneficial for somebody. So, you know, toothpaste is a great product, but 90%, 99% of the population are only getting the soap effect of the toothpaste. The second element of our toothpaste is it's a medicinal carrier. It's a, it's a fluoride distribution product. It's a baking soda distribu uh, distribution product. Or potassium nitrate or peroxides or whatever else we want on their teeth. But how many people come into your practice if you ask them, do you brush immediately or do you rinse immediately after you brush or do you expectorate the excess and let it stand on your teeth for 10 or 15 minutes? So by simply advising our patients to do that, they're now going to get the clinical effect of the prescriptions that are in the, the toothpaste as opposed to just getting 
the scrubbing and the soap effect of the toothpaste. So that would be one thing that we advise our patients on. And, and one thing I want to inject on that, if you look at just the research for removing plaque, toothpaste is, is not, I mean, dry brushing. If, if you dry brush, you need to dry brush for two minutes yep. twice a day. Yeah. And nobody, for removing plaque, it's straight, soft bristles for two minutes, and the toothpaste has no help or hurt on removing the plaque. And um, who was the hygienist that schooled me on that? Um, I mean, she gave me she gave me PDFs this thick. I mean, yeah. the the research dry brush. So, but when you said baking soda for lowering pH, do you mean like our grandmas did, where they just had a box of Arm and <laughs> Hammer and wetted the toothbrush and yeah. stuck it in the box? Or are you talking Arm and Hammer toothpaste? Well, either or. Uh, I don't love the I don't love it when people are just you know using baking soda out of the box. It's definitely more abrasive. All I want. I think an oral rinse of baking soda is better than even brushing with it. But some an of the oral rinse, a teaspoon and put it in eight ounces water. of water. Yeah, just keep it in your bottle. So just to we, lower the pH. I'll give you an example. If we have a patient that comes in, they've got uh, medication-induced dry mouth. They're high caries risk, or they've been through cancer or radiation therapy, and now their salivary glands aren't, you know, putting out the quality or the quantity of saliva that they need. In addition to advising them on how to use their toothpaste, right? So toothpaste is two things. It's a surfactant. It decreases surface tension, so it does help scrub things off easier, but you're right. It's the toothbrush that does the job, right? And it's a medicinal carrier. We want the fluoride on the teeth because it targets the bacteria that's converting sugar to acid. If people don't really understand what that is, what fluoride does, it inhibits a bacteria's ability to metabolize sugar. And so we can starve the population because we affect its inability to get their dietary source for nutrition, right? So that's really what fluoride does for us, and it puts mineral back in the teeth, you know, the surface areas of the teeth. That's all fluoride does. But if we're fighting acid, fluoride is ineffective. It's not, an, it's not a pH neutralizer. So if you then take, like, baking soda and you add it to the product, um, my favorite product line, and I, and I, you know, I don't have any money invested with them or anything, but Arm & Hammer's brand is the easiest, most basic product line because every one of their toothpaste products has at least a thousand parts per million fluoride and every one of their products has baking soda. If people want to put other stuff in it after that, I don't care. If they want some potassium nitrate, get the sensitive one. If they want to whiten their teeth, get the one that's got peroxides in it. You know, so that it's a real simple product line. We keep a chart in our office that just shows them, here's an example of what you need to be buying and this is how you need to use it. So when you get back down now and you're talking about coffee, I'm not going to get into talking to my patients about whether or not they should or shouldn't be drinking coffee. Visamon is, it's better to drink it in five minutes than it is to drink it in an hour in five minutes. So don't and they, really they sip on it all day? They sip on it. They, they take it to their cubicle. Yeah. Our best friend in the industry of dentistry is Starbucks. You know, I mean, look, look at what they're doing to promote what we're doing in dentistry. If you've got a business mindset and not a diagnostic mindset, then I would target every single person with the, that you see frequenting Starbucks because they're going to have an increased risk for tooth decay. And by the way, um, you kids, a lot of dentists think Arm & Hammer uh, can you text me Armand Hammer's uh, autobiography, not his yeah. biography? I, I read his biography and his autobiography. I've done that several times on a lot of people. So a lot of people's autobiographies are very flattering of themselves. Yeah. And a lot of biographies are very brutal. And <laughs> Armand Hammer, that's a classic. His, Interesting. Um, but, but I always want to read the autobiography because the journalist sitting in the, um, in the library giving me the Kim Kardashian view of his life. I don't give a shit. Right. I want to know the genius business insight. And usually on those big autobiographies, there's only like one or two. And But Armand Hammer was, uh, he just thought it was so funny anywhere he goes here with his whole life. Here he was a billionaire with Oxidol Petroleum and everybody right. thought he invented baking soda. Right. And uh, in, <laughs> fact, in fact, one time he even called them and he said, uh, you know, I think I'm just going to buy your damn company just so... Yeah. So I can say, yeah, you know, I own yeah. Armand Hammer. <laughs> but the one takeaway lesson from that guy was just genius. He was a, um, he was a pharmacist in New York City. Did you ever read his book? I haven't, but he, you're inspiring me to do it. Well, well you don't have to because there's only one lesson learned. He was a pharmacist in New York City. And, you know, in, um, back in the day, 100 years ago, 
um, New York City had these very distinct neighborhoods you didn't cross. I mean, this was the Italian neighborhood, and this is the Irish, and the Polacks, and the Russians, and the Jews, and the you know all all these ethnicities. Where if you walk down the wrong street, you get shipping at you. Right. Well, he was um, he was Russian ancestry, so he lived in the Russian neighborhood, and he kept hearing all these people coming into the pharmacy saying that. Russia had more oil and gas than, than anybody that knew of at the time, but nobody um, could get through their stupid um, agencies, and there were big national oil companies like Exxon and all that that had been working four or five years in the and couldn't get nowhere. But he also heard other people, they were always talking about Stalin, they saying that Stalin, he only liked two things about America, Hershey's chocolate bars mm. and um, um, Marlboro Red cigarettes. Right. So here's a pharmacist. So he um, saves up his money, gets a big case, half Arm and Hammer, uh, half chocolate bars, Hershey chocolate bars, half Marlboro, and he goes to New York and he looks for a, um, he charters a jet, and he lies to the pilot. He says, um, he goes, well, you, you can't fly over the Berlin Wall and go to Moscow. And he goes, no, no, Stalin wants to see me. He just kept telling everyone Stalin wants to see him, and he made the pilot leave. So the pilot. Okay, so he put him on the airplane and they took off in Berlin, flew the Berlin Wall. Two MiGs were on his ass right away. And they said, what are you doing? He says, I, I'm with uh, Dr. Armin Hammer. He's a pharmacist. I'm with Dr. Armin Hammer and he has an appointment with Stalin. So the MiG guys are like, you know, we're not, we're not going to shoot down, you know, Stalin's <laughs> next meeting. So they landed. All his military people come. They take him all the way to Stalin. And Stalin says, uh, who are you? I have a meeting with you. And he goes, um... I brought you a gift, and he opened up this huge box, and it was half um, um, chocolate, Hershey chocolate bar and half Marlboro cigarettes, and Stalin smiled, and he gave a big hug, and he said, here are you, and he says, well, I, I'm from the Russian part of New York, and everybody wants to drill oil and gas, but nobody can get through your Department of Interior, and he took out a piece of paper, and he said, if you say no to this man, I will kill you, and gave it wow. back to, so he became a billionaire, Occidental Petroleum, just because of one lesson, go to the top. Huh. And and there's just people who, you know, they, they're trying to do something. They call up the your receptionist and she says no and they, that's the end of the cell. Yeah. And there's other telemarketers that can talk through that gateway keeper. Yeah. Uh, they do it to me all the time. Now my staff, it's really easy for me because when they're bullshitting they always go, um, yeah, I went to school with Dr. Farron. <laughs> and they're all like, huh. Then, uh, so nobody can say Farran. Right. I mean, it's just two words, Far and Ran, Farran, it's Irish. And uh, so, but uh, that was a badass lesson. A he became a lesson. billionaire from one move yeah. that was pure balls, and he could have been, he could have been spent the rest of his life in Siberia. You know, it's, he could have shot him on sight for lying. Let, let me ask you this: question. How you take your front office people, and how often do our front office people shield us from our patients? Right? Oh, the doctor doesn't want to be disturbed with this or that. Well, what about people that are looking into your practice? There's no better purveyor of your practice philosophy than you are. You know, so we, in our recent marketing efforts in our practice, when somebody calls in, if we haven't captured them in our practice software to be able to reach out to them and convey our message to them, if they call and they don't acclimate as a patient, you've lost the ability to share your influence with them. So, you know, we're using automated systems now where, you know, people who call in to inquire get a letter that says, hey, if we didn't answer your questions, here's my personal email talk to me. And if you don't want to communicate that way, push this button and I will call you back after five o'clock and I'm going to get you the information about us that you need to hear. Right? We, 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 we talk about, you know, trying to keep people out of our practice, but the people who need to hear who you are were not innovated enough to get our message out so that we can nurture them, that we can help them understand who we are, what we do, especially with, you know, valuable, valuable messages that have an ultimate ability to change people's lives, right? So we're talking about toothpaste. We're talking about how to use it. We're talking about bacteria. That's all stuff that we should have learned more clearly while we were in dental school. The message was never conveyed to us very clearly. Jaw biomechanics, acid, and inflammation are what we are trying to help people avoid the effects. Jaw biomechanics, acid, and inflammation. Yeah, so let, let's take, for example, Howard. What, what about these thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans who have digestive issues? How many people in your practice do you come across that are suffering with heartburn or acid reflux? How many people? I want to ask you two things about that. Yeah. Um, 
Nothing ruffles feathers more than closed-minded dentists. Yeah. Is when you say the word holistic or alternative medicine or this and that. But I'm always from this view that a thousand years from now, most of what we believe now is going to look crazy. Yeah. And I have had two patients in 30 years, both of them were engineers, who had that um, regurgitation. Sometimes they'd wake up in the middle of the night, couldn't even breathe. And they put a red brick under both front legs of their bed because they wanted the esophagus in pipe to the stomach to be higher than the, the esophagus exit to a, what is it, duodenum? Yeah. And uh, I can't say their names because it's a HIPAA violation and all that, and Bernard Wells could sue me. And, uh, but he, uh, you know, he just lifted up an inch, problem solved. And I've had about 10 patients tell me that when they get into Justin, they start doing that, they take a, um, a, a shot of apple cider vinegar. Huge. Is that that you heard? Absolutely, it's part of our protocols. And, and a dentist, of course, the dentists say, well, that's holistic. <laughs> you need to take a prescription for Pepsi or, or you know, they, they always have to write a prescription. And then when someone on Pinterest or Facebook is saying, use apple cider vinegar or elevate your bed, then yeah. they're a wacko, quacko. But if you, so for me, so, so, we, so tell me about why those, those two work. You, you'd use the term holistic dentistry, right? In my philosophy, I, if people ask me, so, oh, so are you a holistic guy? Well, I'm, I'm not. I don't really understand what that means, but I'm into, <coughs> I'm into primary care targeting the areas that are specifically causing issues in patients' mouths. So let's take this one thing. When you see a patient come in and they have abfraction, enamel crazing, and wear facets, you know you're dealing with a jaw biomechanics problem. That's a wear and tear pattern, right? But what about if they have wear and the incisal edges of their teeth are cupped out, right? Acid. Or their, their enamel is thinning, or they have not deep, like, uh, tree-cut abfraction, but it's smooth, and you're just seeing the, the roots of their teeth erode away. That's an acid problem, and there's a source that it's coming from, and when it comes from the stomach, the acid's so intense, it eats minerals out of the teeth faster than tooth decay can develop. So tooth decay is just where minerals been lost, and it's the nasty collagen and elastin that's left behind the soft stuff, right? So we go in there, we dig that out, we put our fake, you know, our prosthetic materials back into the tooth. But when you're dealing with a stomach acid problem, the rate of mineral loss occurs at a much faster rate. So you can know that somewhere they're getting an acid source that's very, very intense, and usually it's a digestive acid. People who suffer with inflammatory bowel disease or uh, Crohn's, or they have digestive problems, okay? So let's look at this right now. You, you mentioned apple cider vinegar, and you're asking me why does that work? Well, do you think it works? 100%, and I am the patient that has struggled with, with all of these issues, and it's taking me years to sort out what my problems were to try to get to the bottom, and it's where a lot of our protocols came from. But here's why it works. Most people think that digestive issues you know, we're not even looking at the term digestive problem. It's actually an indigestive problem. So for most people that are suffering with that, it's not because they're overproducing stomach acid, the hydrochloric digestive acid that our stomach needs, right? That acid is crucial because there's receptors in your body that recognize that type of acid. Your pancreas doesn't turn on until the pH of your stomach drops below three. Your gallbladder never gets the signal to do its job until the pH of your stomach drops below three. So most people who suffer with these problems, it's not that they're overproducing acid. That doesn't even make sense. What, what, what part of your body, Howard, has gotten better at what it does as you've gotten older? I can't think of it. I'm 46, and I can't think well, of see, anything. I can't see, I can't hear, I can't remember shit. Right. Uh, so, a hot yeah. woman walks by, doesn't even phase me. It's like, who cares? That looks exhausting. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, looking, we're, looking at the, we're looking at the cells that produce acid in the stomach. Oh, right? I do, I, I do have one thing. What is it? The hair in my ears. Oh. It's growing so much better than I was Ryan's age. Yeah, but those I are... I can grow air here. Ear hair and nose hair, but that's like cancer yeah. type hair, you know, it's like yeah. gets and turned women, on and it won't stop. Women love that <laughs> ear hair. But, uh, but anyway, yeah. so, so, so then the apple side, go ahead. Well, so what apple. happens is, is in most instances, the vast majority of people suffering with that, it's not because they're overproducing acid. They've underproduced acid. So instead of food being readily broken down and digested and moved through the tract the way it should, it sits in the stomach and it ferments. 
and it's the fermentable acids that people are filling in heartburn and acid reflux and GERD. So pyruvic acids, sulfuric acids, these are all the type of acids. Their pH is different, their chemistry is different, our body doesn't recognize it, our tissues don't tolerate it as well. So the key then is the reason that apple cider vinegar works is you're increasing the acidic content of the stomach to help in the digestion of food. The acid that works the best though is hydrochloric acid. So when, you're, when your body's pH drops below three, when your stomach's digestive tract does, it, turns, it gets all the organs ready for digestion. For example, a lot of people have a hard time with, with greasy foods. Well, if the, if the gallbladder or your biliary system never gets chemically activated to turn on, you don't produce the bile salts that are there to emulsify fat. So any fat-soluble nutrients never get absorbed. Your, your A, your D, your E, your K, your, your C, and your B vitamins. Well, the downside to that is those are the vitamins that, that help you in tissue repair. You know, vitamin D and calcium are what help you reacclimate mineral into your bone. You know, your, your, your E, your B, those are energy vitamins, and they also help in tissue repair. So it's really common for people with these digestive problems to end up with absorption deficiencies as well. They're all vitamin D deficient. They're generally low in, in B6, B12, folate vitamins. And so what happens is it creates this cascade of events. It increases systemic inflammation, which causes mu muscle achiness, joint pain. So many people think that they've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and what they're really dealing with is, is a, a digestive an indigestion problem that's increasing sy systemic acidities and, and systemic inflammations, right? So it creates these myriad of problems. The end result of that is chronic fatigue. As your body's trying to fight those metabolics, you know, you can end up with sleep disorders. You know, your cortisol levels increase, sleep disorders increase. When you're tired, you compensate that with caffeine. Caffeine triggers the adrenal glands. The response to adrenaline is cortisol. So you start putting on mid-belly, uh, fat, you start losing the ability to stay asleep after you've gone to sleep. So there's this myriad of problems that people start to experience and they're easy to identify in your practice if you just understand what's happening. Now here's the downside. Our medical industry wants to treat the problem by putting people on medicines that stop those acid cells from producing acid. Pepsi, or what its name is yeah. on so, so any omeprazole, any proton pump inhibitor. inhibitor. What are some of the brand names? Prevacid, um, loratadine. You know, most of the prescription ones are omeprazole-based. They're proton pump inhibitors. Now, some of them are over-the-counter now, aren't they? Yeah, some of them have been so clinically effective, they're available over-the-counter for... And what are some of their brand names? Uh, so, like, Pep, uh, Prevacid is one of the popular ones. Um, you can just get generic omeprazole over the counter. It's a lower dose concentration than you can get in prescription form, but they are available and they, they do work. There's a there's hundred different types of but these. But what do you think of those using that long term? The biggest issue with using those is you're, one, you're making that problem worse. So you're going to increase the amount of fermentable acids in your body if you decrease the amount of hydrochloric acid that you need for digestion. So oral complications get worse. The second thing is, is that they, once you change the chemistry of the stomach and you're no longer absorbing what you need, vitamin D becomes deficient and osteoporosis, osteopenia can become a long-term problem because if you're not getting, you know, none of us get enough vitamin D from sunlight conversion. We have to have some kind of dietary absorption uh, portions of vitamin D, right? So when you're deficient in vitamin D, you no longer have the chemical signal. Vitamin D takes the signals and turns them on that puts calcium back in your bone. And what we end up with is if we have a highly acidic systems or highly inflammatory systems, basically what's happening is that acid environment or the need for calcium in other areas like musculature, your body's constantly taking calcium out of the bones and it's putting it elsewhere. And so osteopenia sets in, osteoporosis sets in. Let's take the pancreas. If digestion isn't occurring properly and acidity levels increase, 
inflammation will increase. Inflammation of the pancreas, which, which produces insulin to redistribute um, you know, sugars throughout the body where they need to be. It affects the uh, pancreas and increases your risk for type 2 diabetes. If you have systemic inflammation, your, your risks for cardiovascular disease go up. Have you ever read Bell Donin? Uh, yeah, he's been on the show. Isn't that remarkable? I, I did a podcast interview in conjunction with him where we're talking about the effects of, of acidity and inflammation in the human body. But as dentists, we're not looking at it and saying, okay, I got a patient with a real high caries risk, and I'm going to tell them to brush their teeth, and I'm going to tell them to watch these acidic products that they're drinking, but we're never talking to them about these digestive problems. Well, one of the things that commonly occurs with people that have digestive issues malabsorption of fat-soluble vitamins is that it affects the, the physiology of musculature. You need calcium and you need potassium for muscle contraction and muscle relaxation, right? Well, a muscle also needs glycogen. So if you get a patient who's prone to bruxism, and by the way, one of the contributing factors to bruxism is inflammation and acidity in musculature. It's a trigger. You know, if you go to the gym and you have a tough workout, you're really sore two days later. Right. Any good trainer is going to tell you to work through it because as you exercise those muscles, you can push the lactic acid out, right? Well, the same is true. We have this, this event, this parafunction that's triggered when acidity is too high in our facial, muscu facial musculature that induces clenching and grinding to try to work that muscle to get the acid out. And it's a subconscious event, and that's why people do it at night while they sleep. Well, if a muscle has, is predisposed to acidity and inflammatory issues, and you couple that with the parafunctional habits of bruxism, it fatigues the muscle, it depletes its resources, and so people with digestive problems commonly are also bruxers, and they also are commonly experiencing chronic issues of TMD, TMD pain, chronic facial pain, chronic headaches, because everything has this heightened uh, issue of tissue injury. And so the way, that, so when it comes down to a biofunctional philosophy, you know, people ask me, this stuff seems so complicated. Why would you get involved in this? And here's why. I am in a dental marketing space where there's zero competition because I've never met a dentist that understands the connection that these people are having. So when I'm marketing to my patients, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on these places. I'm finding patients with these acid disorders, and here's where I find them. They're in your gastroenterologist's office. They're, your, they're in your... Uh, ear, nose, and throat specialist office. They're inhabiting pain management clinics. They are in um, uh, neurology offices. They have these facial pain, these headaches. They have these digestive disorders. And essentially what happens is most of these people have become like dental and medical refugees because they go from office to office to office. They never get it figured out why they're having this, fa this facial pain. Uh, we're doing a good job in dentistry to understand how to treat biomechanical problems. You know, you have fathers in that area. You've, you've got Pinky. You've got, you know, Pinky Man Schuler. You've got Spear who's out there doing this stuff. You have places like LVI that are teaching us how to manage the biomechanics of occlusal disease. But where are we learning how to counter counteract the effects of acid and inflammation that's also triggering these chronic dental problems. And it just doesn't exist out there. And that's where you know, the advanced prosthetics you know, um, comes in. When your actions don't match your words, you know, there's something going on there. And all the dentists on Dentaltown, they cringe at holistic, alternative medicine. A lot of them don't even believe the oral systemic health deal, okay? Right. 
But their actions told me they were because when they're on dental town and they're saying that, you know, they got older and they went to the doctor and they said, oh, you need to take a high blood pressure medication and then you cholesterol is high. You need to take a statin and you need to get on two, three, four prescriptions. They go, no way. <laughs> right. So they changed their diet and their lifestyle and all that. And then I'm like, oh, are you holistic now? <laughs> what are you, a hippie? <laughs> what, you moved to Oregon for a retreat or something? Yeah. And um, when people talk about, um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe news. I mean, they say if you call it fake news, you're a conspiracy guy. But, but you know, like um, 200,000 Americans die each year in the hospital system not caused by their initial disease. It's right. iatrogenic. Um, they talk a lot about polyphagia. By the time you're on five prescriptions, your mortality goes off the charts. And, you know... Um, CNN and Fox News, they, they never cover any of these stories because every other commercial is a prescription pill. Yeah. And so they want to talk about, you know, um, politics or, or they'll go after any industry that doesn't advertise. Yeah. Well, that, that's fake news. Right. You know what I mean? And, and I've been a dentist out here for 30 years. And when you know, so many people retired to Arizona and they're like, oh, I finally got here. And when they're 65 and they're coming in and they're on, already on, like, on five prescriptions, yeah. They're, they're not alive 10 years later. Right. And all my patients that are 90 to 103, they're not on any prescriptions. And what's funny is healthcare is in this weird state right now where the doctor just like, uh, the exam is 10 minutes. Well, how are you doing? Well, I can't sleep well. Well, here, here take a sleeping pill. Yeah. Well, you know, I got high cholesterol. Oh, here, take, take a cholesterol pill. Oh, I got high blood Oh, I take a blood pressure pill. And it's like, and then the doctor goes home and he uses alternative medicine and, and changes diet and exercise. And medicine, you know what the first prescription pill was? You know what the first cure for disease was? Oh. It was a Lyme. Oh. Um, a British physician, every time the British Navy, the British Navy ruled the world, their empire was, what, 65 countries, including the United States, Canada, India, Hong Kong, Australia. And every time they came back, about a quarter of the crew had died from scurvy. Wow. And one time the ships came back and one ship, no one had died. And that physician, you know, uh, luck and being aware, and he's like, oh my God, um, he freaked out and he told everybody, we, we, we have to study, this. something's on the ship. So they quarantined all the boats, they took down all the items, and they couldn't figure it out. And, and they looked at the list and said, well, the only thing different was those guys left with a barrel of limes. So he said there's some vit vitamin C lime. for citrus. I was thinking L-Y-M-E, and I think, oh, uh, yeah, limes. But you're talking about, yeah. Limes. Yeah. So they, they still C. call the British U.S., the, the British, the U.K. Navy, limeys. Yeah. And it was a lime, and it had something in there. They called it vitamin C for citrus. Right. The C was for citrus. And then the greatest president we ever had for healthcare, in my opinion, was um, Truman. Because he kept asking me, what's all this goiter? How can we cure it? And they said, well, we don't know how to cure it, but it's from lack of iodine. He said, how can we get these farm kids in Kansas? And they said, well, iodize the salt. Goiter's gone. All these people, all these millennials listening, they've never even seen a person with goiter. Um, vitamin D you keep talking about. Yeah. And that was to cure rickets. Yeah. Um, um, and then what was the, and then he, Truman passed the law that all bread had to be fortified with B6, B12, and riboflavin. Yep. What was that to prevent? So B6 and B12, all right. So those, again, the, the B vitamins are fat-soluble vitamins. So when we're talking about, when we're talking about digestion, right, your, how, how many people do you know that suffer with gallbladder problems? I, I mean, so many of my patients have had their gallbladder removed. If somebody had just recognized early on that they had a digestion problem and that organ wasn't getting turned on, before that organ became deficient, it probably, instead of producing bile, it was producing bile sludges. And then it just kind of stopped working altogether because the chemistry wasn't activating the organ to make it do its job, which is help us with digesting and absorbing fat, oils, those things that we got to get through our system, absorb what we need, but we do need to get rid of it because we don't need everything in it. So, you know, we've got, we've got food intake, we've got food breakdown, we've got digestion, we've got absorption, and then we have excretion. And when we miss something in that chain, it really, you know, the body's an amazing well, thing. What was the disease Truman was targeting? B6, B, all bread to, is still fortified. So there. folate is a B vitamin. B6, and it was, B12. It was creating a lot of problem in birth defects. And I don't know if that's the reason. I don't, I don't know the report it? that you're talking about. Okay, so was this, um, vitamin C was scurvy, D was rickets, iodized salt was goiter, 
Damn, what was the other one, Ryan? Was that? What, why did Truman put B6, B12, riboflavin in all the bread products? It was one specific disease. But anyway, but anyway, he extinct all those disease. And then when he got to our disease, fluoride in the water, yeah. that was the only one that had pushback. They didn't care their salt was iodized. <laughs> no one said anything about vitamin D. <laughs> right. These millennials have never seen an American with rickets. Right. They've never seen anybody with gorder. But when it went to fluoride in the water, um, all hell broke loose. You know why? Because Stalin fluoridated Moscow. And, Interesting. And so they knew that he was such an, an evil man yeah. that there could be no good reason that he did that. Yeah. So they believed, a lot of Americans, about a quarter, believed that when you drank fluoridated water, it made you more susceptible to communist ideology. Interesting. And so Truman <laughs> said, so Truman said, well, we're going to leave that one to the local state and issue. And from that day forward, only 70, 75% of the towns of 19,008 towns were fluoridated on any given year. And when you add it to a couple towns and some rednecks take it out of another town, but the reason, uh, and, 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 I, and during the, Obama, the Affordable Health Care Act, I was writing so many letters saying, you know, if, you know, dentistry is 5% of the budget. You want to do one damn thing for dentistry? Make the water fluoridation a federal law like you do with iodized salt, vitamin D and milk, um, B6, B12, riboflavin. Damn it, what was that disease? B6, B12, riboflavin. It was a well, specific. I know that those, those vitamins are part of our energy resources. Yeah. They're also helping tissue repair. So I'm going to guess whatever the illness was that they were trying to help, it either yeah. had probably something to do with birth defects or something to do with and also, tissue also, regeneration. I also read another deal about um, vitamin D from sun exposure yeah. and milk that the average American, when you go have lunch outside for a picnic, yeah. they just have your head and your hands and your forearms exposed the whole hour lunch wouldn't be enough. Yeah. But if you laid out there completely nude in your backyard for just five minutes on either side, you get enough. But I, I was leading all that back because this is what I wanted to come back with on your digestion all that stuff. So we, we, you and I knew when we were little and got out of school that if you touch your saliva and you could pull a string that would touch your finger and it was thick and tacky, they had an off the chart decay rate. Yeah. But if you couldn't pull up their saliva, they had a low decay rate. But we keep having these um, pediatric deaths from um, anesthesia, and we just had um, another one in Yuma right before Christmas. And, um, and that guy, god dang it, that guy's a rocking hot board certified pediatric deal. You'd send your kid there tomorrow. I got two grandkids walking and two in the oven. I'd send them all four of mine. Of course, the press, all they want to talk about is, doctor, you know, your patient died. But I want to know, why does a two-year-old need eight pulpotomies and acrobatic care? And by the way, media, they took that kid to general dentist, like me and Jason. We're not going to touch a screaming, yelling child. Right. In the old day, they used to strap him down to a papoose board and just yep. do it. But then Can't the psychologist got all mad that stuff, and said yeah. that's abusive. And then when you put someone under IV sedation, um, every, pretty much everyone that dies from IV sedation is under 12 and over 65. You know that, in fact, the only three publicly traded dental companies on earth, two in Australia, one 300 Smiles and Pacific Smiles, and then uh, Q&M in Singapore, they don't let their oral surgeons do IV station. N nobody can put anyone under, under 12, over 65, because now you just got rid of all your one in a million chances that I mean, I mean, very famous people died of that. I mean, who was that? Joan Rivers. Yeah. You know, she had a little IV and her, got a laryngospasm. Yeah. But anyway, but my, my problem is this. Um, I've been out here 30 years. There's something going on because um, that two-year-old, I mean, why does a two-year-old need eight pulpotomies and a chrome still crown it too? And the media is never going to say, hey, what kind of parent are you? Yeah, J Jason, how did you raise a two-year-old that needed eight root canals? Exactly. And then, and then we always say, well, it's got to be the Mountain Dew, this and that. But for me, there's one more variable that I think's in there. Because when I've seen it for 30 years, the mom's got rotten teeth, the dad's got rotten teeth, this baby gets rotten teeth out of the gate. And I think it's because they're all kissing them. And they, they take a spoon, they they blow on it, and there's 100,000 strawberry cosmic yep. tans. And I mean, and, uh, and, then, and then grandparents babysitting. I mean, these grandparents um, have an upper and lower partial perio disease, and they're babysitting their grandbaby all day, and they're, they're kissing it 15 times a day. So my, my question is this. From what you know, where you focus on occlusal disease, um, systemic acidity, inflammation, 
What needs a change at home so a two-year-old doesn't need to be IV sedation for eight pulpotomies? Yeah. So we got to get out of the mindset of just proposing care to people. We've got to quit being dental mechanics, and we really need to become diagnosticians first, which means opening our minds. And I just want to interrupt one thing on that. The worst thing about a pulpotomy in a chrome still crown, it only has a two-year survival rate. Yeah. So your mechanic <laughs> job was a band-aid for two years. You didn't yeah. change anything causing all this stuff. Yeah. And pulpotomies and chrome still crowns are rotten again in 24 months. Yeah. But continue. Sorry. So let, let's take that. Okay, let's just go back to the acid problem. Bacteria that convert sugar to acid, dietary sources of acid. If we could just start there, and this is kind of what you're talking about, it's a good start, but we can't miss this whole other element. So let's look at a baby's digestive tract, right? What, what's happened in the world over time when it comes to women in the workforce? Most of them have converted from breastfeeding their children to formula, right? Well, most formulas are a milk-based product with a lot of preservatives in it and whatever other nutrients need to be supplemented into there. It's a foreign, it's a foreign object to our digestive tract, right? Now, we, we do it because it's food sources, but think about the American diet. How many preservatives are in the food that we eat? How many food intolerances and food allergies have increased over the last 20 years? You know, the, the nutrient of our diets has decreased. The preservatives in our diet have increased. Artificial supplementation has increased. So when we take it and we convert this back to kids, right? I don't know what your kids eat, but Macaroni and cheese, if it can be microwaved, if it's preserved, that's really what these kids are living on. And so the challenging and ease and, and yeah, effortless. Yeah, convenience because convenience, it's, it's, it's an American way. We've, we've got to get things done quickly. But if you just take like formula, for example, it's a lactose-based, it's a milk-based product, which, you know, underdeveloped digestive tracts can't process that much lactose, so it can create issues that way. Um, you know, the, the, the processed foods, you know, one of the things that I struggle with personally is there are certain preservatives that increase inflammation in my body to the point where my joints hurt, my muscles hurt, I get these incredible knots, it brings on jaw pain, I'll get these back spasms that just come on instantaneously, so I have to avoid milk altogether. Because I have a casein protein intolerance and allergy, it's now developed into lactose intolerance. So it's created a digestive problem. And so with a lot of these kids, we're not really, we think they're young and they're healthy, but we're not really looking at the way the digestive tract is being affected by dietary things. So a lot of these kids, when you see them, if mom and dad are doing a good job with home care and they're, they're proactive with that, and they're not giving babies bottles when they go to bed, juices and things like that that are just coating their teeth in sugar that's converting to acid. If those things are in line and we're still seeing that, we've got to quit blaming mom and dad, thinking that they're, they're not doing right for their kids. We have to start looking at something else, which is the other source, a very predominant source of acid that could be affecting these issues, and that can be a digestive problem. So you originally asked me why apple cider vinegar works. Okay, we have to be conscientious of doing two things, oral acidity neutralization and systemic alkalinization. We have to get the digestive tract working again. Now, I know that's kind of outside of our realm, but there's some simple protocols we can help people with right off the bat. So we have a protocol that we use in our practice. Um, the kidney or the, the liver plays an important role in producing, you know, it's in the biliary system for producing bile. Uh, detoxifying the kidney, raw apple juice is a great detoxifier of the kidney. So we put our patients on a protocol, as long as there's not like a diabetic problem, six to eight ounces of raw apple juice, not the crap that you get at Walmart, but the stuff you get at the health food store, can be a great kidney detoxifier to get it working and free it up. And apples are, um, the brain, the number one mineral the brain uses is calcium, and number two is lithium. Yep. And which food has the highest amount of lithium? Apples. Apples. And what was the first drug for um, insane people? Yeah. Lithium. Yeah, bipolar disease as yeah. well. Lithium yeah. really makes a big difference so, in that. So, yeah. so that would be the first step. They wait 15 minutes, and then we have them put together a concoction of four things. Uh, lemon juice, which is a great systemic al alkalizer. It also increases stomach acidity. Uh, Bragg's olive oil, unfiltered olive oil. 
and then apple cider vinegar. And when you use the apple cider vinegar, you want to be using the stuff that's got the mother, an unfiltered apple cider vinegar. Where take Will you get our apple cider vinegar and see if, it, if we got the right one? Yeah. So well, that, which apple cider vinegar do you recommend? You know, we, we typically re re recommend Bragg's because it's easy to get. Bragg's. Bragg's brand. And Are you, you want... bragging about Bragg's again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> It'll say the mother. You'll see the stuff in the bottom of it. That's the apple cider vinegar that you want to be using. You don't want to be used like a Heinz filter. Or... That's a lot of sugar. Most of the nutrient value is gone. But what that does, yeah, that's the right stuff. Is that it? Where's the same mother? So you see this stuff down here? Yeah. Yeah, what is that? With the mother. I never even noticed that. <laughs> oh, I bought, bought, I never even noticed it was a bag. Brian yeah. Organic Raw Unfiltered Apple Cider Vinegar. Huh, that is amazing. So Maya. If you have, are you suffering with some acid issues? Uh, well, for him, uh, I, I'm just going to say it's one of my four boys, and um, he he's had this issue on and off, and the only thing that works for him is that. Yeah. We have a protocol. I can You take a... He takes a, you take, just take a shot? So what, what uh, we typically recommend is you take a teaspoon and a half of lemon juice, purely squeezed lemon juice. One lemon will give you about three dosages. Which out here, I, I, I don't mean to brag, but um, everybody's got a lemon tree in the backyard. In fact, when my lemons are blooming, like, see that? See, yeah. my, see my neighbors, <laughs> see the orange lemon? Yeah, it goes So all my neighbors, neighbors, I mean, they have lemons and oranges hanging over my fence. But yeah, so, yeah. so you recommend just go get a real lemon. I just get a bag of lemons, them. keep them at home. I'll take one lemon, I'll cut it in a third. I'll squeeze that into a small glass. I'll take a teaspoon and a half of apple cider vinegar and a teaspoon and a half of uh, pure virgin olive oil. Bragg's unfiltered olive oil. So you're getting your... Oh, so the same company. Mm-hmm. So Ryan. Yes. So this same company, Bragg's, makes a pure unfiltered olive oil? They do. Is it real thick? Can uh, we buy that next time we're at the store? So Howard, when you, when you get the digestive thing going, now we got to talk about... Th there's another element down there that helps in digestion. There's a bacteria in your stomach that has enzymatic activity that helps break down food, but when... The pH of our body, when, when the acid content of our system changes, that bacteria has a hard time thriving. So we recommend a very good probiotic, like an FDA-approved company who's producing an, a probiotic where they've proven efficacy and they're showing you what's in there. Okay? I use a product called Biotics Research. It's a great product line. You can get Bi it on Amazon. Um, biotic Research? You can buy it at the store? Uh, you know, I, Amazon's become so <laughs> easy. Yeah. We actually supply it in our office for things that we use it for so we can get our patients started. Bi so it's called what? Biotics Research. Biotics Research. Can you send me that link, Ryan? Yep. And you can buy on Amazon. And by the, the, by the way, um, when I tell you this, you won't believe it. So I'll just, I shouldn't tell you. Jeff Bezos is saying that more people now have Amazon Prime in American households than cable TV. Crazy. And I, you know why I believe it? Because the millennials all have Amazon Prime, yep. and they don't have cable TV. Yep. And then you look at the cable TV data, pretty much the only market they have left is over 50. Yep. And um, they, 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 they've completely, the, the 30 and under is off. Yep. The cable grid. 100%. You know what's so, interesting so in my house? I pay for cable every month. I can't remember the last time I turned my TV on to watch something off of cable. Unless it was like D, uh, DVR or something. So, my like user, now you take this like once a day or? So, it depends. If we have somebody that we're just starting to work with and we know there's a huge uh, digestive issue, we'll start them on a protocol of a probiotic once in the morning and once in the evening. Because as we start to get the acid and we get digestion working, we can reintroduce this, this enzymatic bacteria back into the stomach by changing the environment of the stomach into a condition that it can thrive in. So you want to be adding this to your, to your protocol by, by you know, coming up with a probiotic that's adding digestive help. You know, those enzymes help in absorption, they help in breakdown of food, there's just so many things that, that those uh, digestive bacteria. And Biotics Research, um, they're Twitter, and uh, they're out of uh, Rosenberg, Texas. I wonder where that is. Rosenberg, Texas. Sure. Huh. But um, I got to tell you one other thing about um, 
where this is going if, to kind of give you an open mind if you're uh, in dental school or you're under 30, some little history deals. So the great Americans in the greatest country in the world with the greatest healthcare system, they were cutting out all the ulcers when I was your age. When I was in dental school, you had ulcers, they cut them out. Mm. And it was a female physician in Texas saying, well, this is, it looks like something's going on here, bacteria. It looks like the ulcers were, some war is taking place. Yeah. It's not something that needs to be excised. And so what was the antibiotic? Um, uh, what was that? Cipro. Um, what was the antibiotic for uh, ulcers? They're probably uh, treating H. pylori. Uh, H. H. pylori bacteria. bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. H. pylori bacteria. Now, another woman physician, it was, about, um, it was about 10 years ago, she realized when these kids were on chemo that it destroys their whole gut biome. So the average human looks in the mirror and they, what you think of as you from mom and dad is one trillion cells and animal cells are huge. Think of like the Shea Stadium. But for your mouth to your anus, your rectum is thir thir um, 10 trillion cells. Yeah. So you're at, at one trillion huge animal cells. These are 10 trillion small viruses, microorganisms, fungus, bacteria. And um, this little kid was laying there and he'd done with his treatment. He's all weak and lifeless. And every time he pooped, he cried. His, skin was shedding around his anus and she just looked at that looked at his mother and said you got to go to the you got to take a, a number two do it in this pan she put it in a blender with water gave him a fecal matter enema which is now the number one transplant in the world on any given year is fecal <laughs> transplant the kids snap back to life and a lot of these kids pass chemo they also get depression so and um, they put them on antidepressants and all this stuff and now they're figuring out the the 10 trillion gut microbiome, it even affects the brain, the mood, the whole nine yards. Um, there's another study um, showing um, where they take um, um, skinny mice and give fecal matter transplant to the obese mice, and the obese mice start losing weight. And, um, and, what, and the only negative against fecal matter transplants is if you keep eating a diet that's 60% processed foods, you start feeding the wrong bacteria. Mm -hmm. So you almost have to have a fecal transplant matter every day. And when you change your diet, within 90 days, you change the, the lives in your uh, deal. So when you look at the species, not only is it 10 trillion bacteria, but the San Diego Zoo is the biggest zoo in America and it has 4,200 species. So it's two San Diego zoos worth of species. It's over 8,000. Some people have 10,000 species of life, not from your mom and dad, from your mouth to your rectum. And, and, and that, someday, that holds the clue to periodontal disease and decay. There's something, look, for instance, I have a hygienist who cries. I mean, she's a registered hygienist. She does everything right. And she's over 30 years. You know, she's still losing molars. She's, she can't lick her gum disease. And I mean, she's the absolute crying proof that brushing and flossing alone isn't this disease. There's more, it's multifactorial. And I think someday that we're gonna find out that, you know, um, why you have diarrhea at the back end or constipated, yeah. and why you have this um, mouth bacteria out of whack at this end, a lot of that has to do with what's in the middle, your digestive exactly. system. So look at it like this. So you, you talk about this acid production problem, right? If, you're, if the pH, of, if the chemistry of your stomach never triggers the reaction of your pancreas, the pancreas's job is to neutralize the bolus of food before it passes from the stomach to the lower digestive tract. If it never gets turned on or you are lacking in bicarbonate, the food passes from your stomach into your lower intestine, which is gonna create an acidic environment. It burns that tissue. It doesn't know what to do with it, which increases inflammation. So we see this rise in Crohn's disease, we, irritable bowel syndrome. And if we can just get the, the chemistry right of the stomach for digestion to take place, if we can get the organs turned on that are going to help the rest of the digestive tract. So people who have low acid problems also commonly struggle with either, they either struggle with constipation or diarrhea. And usually it's a combination of... Why are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> you keep me. Let me look at the, uh, look at the audience like, How does he know? How yeah. did he know that? But, uh, yeah. But a lot of it could just be a, di a dietary source or a digestive problem that now isn't letting the organs work that should be, and it's just creating ir irritability, irritation. 
it's a it's an acid chemistry that your your tissues cells don't know what to do with and so it creates okay, we are on so far over time our brand's an hour we're coming up on an hour and a half oh <laughs> um you're amazing um what are my homies gonna find at advanced prosthetic prosthetics institute advanced prosthetics institute yeah what are so, they gonna find there so howard it's it's api dental marketing and education systems our systems are to designed to demystify complex care issues. So what they, when they work with us, what we're going to do is we're going to help them attract a patient base that can really increase practice success. And, and before, I, I know how my homies think. They, yeah. they email, I've been on Dental Town four or five hours a day for since 98, and I answer about 300 emails a day. Um, you're, I know what you're thinking, you're going, yeah, but that's not going to work in my town because I'm, dude, he's in a town of 50,000. Yep. You're a full, t you're doing this full time in a town of 50,000. Yep. Because I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, yeah, if you live in Key Biscayne or Beverly Hills or Manhattan, there'd be enough of these types of patients. No, dude, he's in Prescott. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You take a practice that's got Which like, is, I would say is very just straight middle class. I don't think of it as rich or poor. It's not. Yeah, it's just somewhere in between. You know, Middle class. So we have Tri-City area. We're dealing with... with what are the Tri-Cities? So Prescott Valley and Chino Valley. They're very blue collar, right? Prescott, Farming Chino. communities. Yeah. Then you have Pre Prescott, which is kind of a retirement community. So there's... There's, you're, like you said, middle class, maybe above middle class in Prescott, blue collar farming communities. The thing that's interesting about this is there's no boundaries for it. People who are suffering with jaw biomechanics issues or issues of acidity or inflammation, if you have a patient base of 2,000 people, I guarantee you 35 to 40% of these people are already having this issue. We're not intervening. We're, we're, we're filling gum line up fraction with dental composites. Why are we doing that? We're not even treating the thing that's causing it. So. It's because there's an insurance code. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But there is insurance codes for everything that we do, and it works in every practice from the But how, how do you, do, do, is this, um, do they come to your place to lecture? Is it online so videos? We're, we're, working how, how on our, them? we're working on our online curriculum so we can get our, Howard, this is huge for me that we're here and you're hearing this stuff, and I can see that you're relating to a lot of the stuff we're doing. Simply getting the message out that there's a disease out there that's called a biofunctional disorder, biology and jaw function problems that are overlapping. These people are coming in with severe wear, generalized acid erosion, fraction, enamel crazing. These are people that we're seeing every day. They're also coming with TMJ, chronic facial pain. And all we're doing is we're saying, here's the contributors. Here's how you target each of these categories. This is the care you offer to treat the biomechanics issues. Here's the treatment that you offer to treat the acidity problems. Here's the treatment that you offer to control the inflammatory reactions. We're doing that in dentistry. This, this, this uh, protocol is the glue to every dental procedure that we do. I'm telling you, everything that we do can be tied back to, to these three items. And this particular philosophy can be used. It's ready to be used. Here, here's our beta but, but test. Wait, but, wait, but, but how do my homies learn this? Do, okay. they, do they fly to Prescott? Yes. So we, we, our next course is in March. It's being hosted in Prescott. We have a new facility in Scottsdale uh, through the Dental Success Network that Which we're going to be Mark Costas? Mark Costas is a group. Tell, tell I, I love Mark. He's, he's an idol of mine. He's, I'm, I'm a big Mark House fan. I've had him on here. Tell him it's been three years since he's been on the show. Come back. I'll tell him. And if there's anybody else on your team, have him come back. Okay. We've, we've and, got um, a guy that but, you may But you know, um, one thing that um, I'm just going to get out of my hands and he's a big, you and Cost do is do this. Um, people who have a long curriculum, like look at Pinky and Suit. They have um, five one-week curriculums. So what yep. they do? They made an online CE course in Old Town one hour, which kind of was the greatest hits album of their first week. Best marketing move they made. Yeah. Um, so you have this biomechanics still, biofunctional. Um, you should do an online CE course, yep. and then um, and then like do an article in Dental Town. Just um, so um, that would teach you that drive a lot of people. And once they saw the online CE course or the podcast, and they meet you, they like you, they connect with you, then they would jump on an airplane and fly from Texas. Yeah. Or, you know, so, so when you start looking at that monkey, it's one thing, that's interesting. Yeah. But getting him to go to the airport and fly 
thousands of miles. I'm with you a thousand uh, percent. So, so I, I call it, 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 it deconstruct the sales process. Just, just like the um, house is a very expensive investment that people have. So when grandma wants to buy a reverse annuity, you're not going to do a 30 cent commercial and she's going to sign the paper. So the first commercial, just if you just call, yeah. no salesman call you, but we have to know where your house is to tell you how much. So the, the whole commercial is to get you to call. Yeah. And then when you call, then they send the DVD and, and all that. So I, I think a, um, the podcast will help get your mess out, an online C course, an article, because it's going to take one, two, three before I'm actually going to get on an airplane and fly to Scottsdale. So here's been the challenge. And Howard, this, this day for me is really big because when you're, so the, this, is a, this is a self-pioneered practice philosophy, but the diagnosis has to be in place before we can start to talk about it. And if I use the word biofunctional disorder, there's not a dentist on the planet that even knows what that means. So your influence in allowing me to be here today gives me the opportunity to, to put this word in dentist's mouth there's something that we're missing. We're calling it a biofunctional disorder. Here's the parameters of the disease. Now we can talk about it. Now we can treat it. We can preventively interact uh, on behalf of these patients and stop it. And so we're kind of early on in this phase. And, and so building our message, having an audience to even hear what it is. And now we're, we're working on our resources to do exactly what you're saying. This has to get out. I can't be the only dentist in the world that can help people linking these problems for their for their community, for their patient base, right? So this is really, really a big deal. Do you know Tom Jacoby? Uh, I know the name, but I he's he's a dentist in Chandler. Um, he's been my uh, he's the magazine editorial director for uh, since uh, 2000. So okay. so I have nothing to do with the magazine. And then Howard Goldstein, you know I him? Know Howard, yeah. He's in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. He actually thinks that's where Jesus was born, but I keep telling him that's <laughs> a different about him. And uh, um, he's in charge of the online CE. Yeah. Uh, so send me emails, send those two. But can I keep you? Uh, we're in triple double overtime. Yeah, I, I absolutely. Still got, I still got two issues because I I know my homies. Um, I always say send me an email Howard at dentaltown dot com. Tell me your name, where you're from, what country, um, all that stuff. Um, Twenty five percent are still in dental school. The rest, almost all under 30. Yeah. I get about one email a week now. Some guy saying, hey, dude, I'm as old as you, you know, but it's mostly kids that do podcasts. Yeah. Like you you probably, have you ever even listened to a podcast? I listen to your podcast a lot. In fact, your uh, dental MBA is really what made me decide I needed to look at the business of dentistry. And by the way, that's just a podcast. I, um, yeah. I, um, Dentistry and Censors one, but on iTunes, I also have the 30 Day Dental MBA yep. and the Virtues of Awful Dentistry on YouTube, too. Yeah, the Virtues you that I love. When you go back to Prescott, people your age, do they listen to podcasts? Or is, it's huge. The podcast. Of, of, of our age? Oh, you're, no, no, no. You're, you're 47? Yeah. 46? In the dental industry, I think it's becoming a great resource. No, I'm but as the far as the commercial press. people, not as much. Yeah. It's, it's growing, but. You know, the, the people in my area it's are kind of astute. They're coming from business backgrounds, and so a lot of yeah. them are in the podcasting world. But they're mostly millennials. A lot of them. 100%. Yeah, they're yeah. mostly millennials, and especially on this show. Yep. So my millennials, um, our generation makes it very confusing for them because you keep talking about occlusal disease, yep. and they're walking out there, and they, they distinctly see two groups. There's this Peter, Skyler, Dawson, Coy, Spear, Nash, CR, yep, and then there's this LVI, um, neuromuscular this, and now you're calling them biofunctional. So they're wondering, is biofunctional is that Dawson, Panky, Skyler, Koi, Spear, or is that neuromuscular? And yeah, and 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 then, and then you got to agree with me on this. Is this true or false? If I got all the endodontists in the world together. They don't really argue about anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> the pediatric dentist, the only thing they argue about is one issue, silver diamine fluoride. Yeah. Um, but, man, you bring the occlusal people in, it's like 20 world religions. Exactly. So how, how is a 30-year-old female that graduated from AT still four years ago, and she wants to learn more about occlusion, does she need to pick neuromuscular before CR? How does she... How does she wrap her brain around going to LVI or Spear, yeah. which is both up the street from us? And and how, what is your biofunctional occlusion? So the philosophy. Do you agree that it's confusing? Do you know what I, I think at that level it's absolutely occlusion, 
confusing for people. And I think it's still confusing because we're missing an element of it. Howard, I love what those guys teach in CR. I also appreciate what they're teaching in neuromuscular because we're dealing with two things. We're dealing with hard tissue determinants, but we're also talking about soft tissue determinants. And you have to find, my end result of the combination of the two is you have to create pathways and resources for muscles to work in efficient zones. So centric relation, the muscle was developing at the time the jaw was. There, there's something about this hard determinant and you have to have a building point in reconstruction. When it comes to the muscles though, finding zones makes a big difference, but it's hard to get a muscle to function out of efficient zone if it's an unhealthy muscle. And so what biofunction does is it's taking these hard determinants of occlusion and the issues that we're facing with the soft tissue of musculature and we're getting rid of anything that's a contributor to the problem, to this inefficient, unhealthy working of this entire system. So it really is a different approach, but we are incorporating, we're not reinventing the wheel, you know? The guys that are doing CR, they really understand occlusion. They understand the importance of the joint and the way the joint works. The guys that are doing the musculature stuff, they're trying to find zones where the muscle's happy but we're missing so many components which are the contributors that are causing the problem in the first place. And so this takes those elements and kind of ties them together with an understanding. It's like, well, if I treat somebody for an occlusal disorder, how come it's not 100% effective? Why does 30% of the people continue on with pain? Well, what have you done to treat the muscular issue? Where's the deficiency? Is there a deficiency? Where's the injury? If it is, where's it from? Is it an acid problem or is it an inflammation problem or is it, a, is it a trauma problem? And if we can start to tie these three things together, our core series is demystifying complex care. It's to take these complicated things and give the diagnostic tools these critical thinking skills. Are to you dentists. using any technology in the diagnosis, like tech scan or anything? We like do, 100%. I use mean, the tech it's scan. a phenomenal product. In fact, How I, much is a tech scan now? Um, I think their base system is about 11,000 if you just tried to buy it cold turkey. You know, there's stuff out there online people are picking up for less, you know, older systems. Through our institute, we have a relationship with TechScan. I am not paid by them, but we work together because we utilize their product so much. And so they're willing to offer discounts to people who attend our course so they can onboard that technology without the tremendous expense of getting it rolling. So I don't take kickbacks from them. We just work together because that piece of equipment has a higher ROI than any other piece of equipment that I have in my practice. And I'm a high technology guy. I have all of the CAD CAM stuff. We do digital surgeries. We Which do, CAD CAM do you have? Um, I have the plan scan now. It used to be E4D. Plan scan, which is, um, are you CAD CAMing or just scanning? Uh, so both. So we use that in conjunction with our CT scan. So we do digital, you know, implant planning and design. So Plan Mecca out of Helsinki, Finland, bought E4D yep. out of Dallas. Yep. So now it's called um, Plan, plan scan. scan, and you like that? You know, I, I I'm kind of up in the air on that technology right now. There's a lot of advances being made. You know, when I invested, you know, uh, E4D was kind of ahead of the game over Cirac. CERAC has bounced back with some really incredible technology and products. Now E4D, now you're starting to get these other companies coming out with these really incredible cameras. So I would say just find a system that integrates. You know, if you've got a, if you've got a scanner and a milling system, find a CT scan that it integrates with so that you can find platforms for getting your, your digital design stuff done. But, uh, you know, the, the I've got a Cirac machine. I've got all that stuff. And yep. uh, now um, 3M's trying to sell me a $17,000. What is their scanner called? Uh, it's the I. I know the one you're talking about. Not the about. Itero. The, what's yeah. the, what's, no, Trios is out of um, 3Shape out of uh, Oh, the 3 shape scanner is the one that uh, I was thinking of. Copenhagen, Denmark. True definition. Yeah, true definition. 3M wants me to buy a $17,000 true definition scanner. But you know I, what I've come back to? A $17 3M Emperor gum and send it to my lab man up the street <laughs> yeah. that makes a, a zirconium crown for $99. And um, there, um, There's these moments in time, Howard, I feel the same yeah. where I want to jump yeah. out of that world because it's uh, really, really expensive. And, and the other there. thing is she, listen to this right now, she's 29. She's got $350,000 of student loans. Crazy. So why does she need a $150,000 CAD cam? Um, um, but two more questions. Um, 
you were talking about, you know, we were talking about this two-year-old needing to be put to sleep. And every quarter on um, Facebook, some little kids put to sleep and they die. Yeah. Um, the other thing about this um, switching to baby formula is, you know, the oldest hominid fossil human ever found is right at ASU, yeah. Lucy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Have you ever talked to those anthropologists down there? I haven't. They are turning dentistry upside down. They say, how come there's no malocclusions 300 years to 1.7 million years ago? Right. How come nobody needed ortho and Invisalign? And now all you talk about is, well, we need to put this two-year-old to sleep because it has eight cavities, and then we have 11,000 full-time orthodontists in the United States. I know, I mail a magazine, Orthotown, to them every week. We have a website for them, and nobody's talking about why does this kid need ortho? Because when you're breastfeeding for two or three years, it's a fight. It's a tenacious fight. There's the, the breast is pushing the kid's face or tugging on it. And as soon as the kid has any difficulty breastfeeding, mom's like, well, I'll fix this. I'll switch you a bottle and a sippy cup and just drown you in milk. Um, how do you think we were eating last two million years? Do you think they were eating pureed sauce out of a jar or do you think they throw them a hind leg of, a, of an elk and the baby just chewed on it um, yeah. nuts so all those forces were played into spreading the jaw spreading all this but yeah. um, there's about 10 different anthropological teams that I've posted on Facebook over the last four or five years that independent of any dentist are starting to realize wow why do all why is this new thing because when I was in school they called it mesentogenation. Do you remember that? Mm. And that was totally wrong. They were saying it was mixed breeding. They were saying, well, pure, and there's, so, there, and there's no such thing as a breed of humans. There's breeds of dogs, and breeds of dogs have a larger genetic variance. The, the variance between the two most variant human beings is so narrow, you, you can't even say there's a breed. And they're saying, well, you know, the dad was six foot tall, and he was German, and the mom was a little five foot tall Portuguese woman, <laughs> and uh, that's what happened. A German met a, a Spaniard and, and all this stuff. And no, that's not true. Yeah. It's, um, it's diet. Yeah. They had tenacious, killer diet. And I also think it's a weird culture where women are so embarrassed. They come to my office and they go, is there someplace private I can go to nurse? It's like, yeah. dude, you go to a, a, a PG-13 movie and Rambo would jump out with an AK-47 and mow down 100 people, but you pull out a, a mammary gland and everybody runs to the back door. I mean, right. why is no one afraid? Why is everybody afraid of a mammary gland right. when all mammals give birth to live young and nurse, yeah. but no one's afraid of an AK-47? And um, I, um, you really got to give the kid yeah. A diet that has force. Um, what, what is force? Um, something over area. Um, but anyway, um, but that kid needs to. He needs to use muscles, and he needs to yeah. chew, and he doesn't need a bottle, a sippy cup, and some. some well, but look at it like this: but, you're talking about diet. You know, early early diet. There, there was no. There wasn't a high concentration of sugar or preservatives or these things that our digestive systems didn't know what to do with. So inflammatory issues were lower. System, systemic acidity issues were probably lower because, you know, you talk about blood alleles, those developed during stages of human development, right? And the, the oldest allele is the O-type when people were hunters and gatherers. It was meat and nuts. You know, grains had, didn't even exist. Later alleles developed as we moved more from hunter-gatherer to farmers. You know, those people that developed alleles that you know, their, their immune systems tolerated grains and, and farming type foods, right? So if, depending on blood type, you know, you may have digestive uh, help aids um, based on, you know, what allele you have. I mean, there's so many things involved in this process, but then sugar is high, high, high on generating inflammation. There's just no way around it. And fermentable acids, sugar, carbohydrates, Okay, starches. one final question. Yep. Because we're so over, 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 <laughs> over, over. I'm starting to feel bad, Hal. Um, Hopefully people will hang in there. The 4,000-pound elephant in the room that no one ever talks about who's shoved away in a closet is 4.5% of Americans are shipped off to a nursing home where they die. And um, when they enter the nursing home, the average American gets one root service decay per month. Um, Arizona is a big hotbed. 
Um, maybe she's got grandma in a nursing home. But the bottom line is, um, when you go in there, I, I've gone in there about a dozen different nursing homes and followed the shift. And I don't know why, but they're staffed with mostly little Filipino or Latino women. And um, they have this whole hallway that they got to do everything for, bathe, yeah. feed, everything. You know what the brushing looks like? She cool. takes a brush, she puts a little deal, she goes like this like five times, and then says spit in a Dixie cup. Yeah. I mean, ding, 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 spit. No training, and, and, and she couldn't brush them all for two minutes twice a day and floss her teeth. Shit, and, and you, know what, you know what almost every shift, um, not almost every shift, but you know what their number one emergency call is? 911 to the fire department because they're little, L, they're little CPAs. I mean, they are. I mean, I, I, when I go to a nursing home, I feel like I'm a big dude. When grandpa falls down in the shower, three of them can't get him back in bed. Right. So they got to call the fire department, have six big men come in, and, you know, um, um, hunting and stuff, picking up dead weight of a 225-pound fat grandpa. <laughs> that I mean, you, you can't do that by yourself. <laughs> right. You know, you, you need a lot of people. But anyway, um, so is there anything we can do from that runaway root service decay in nursing homes? The, the bottom line, it's... Acid is going to be the culprit, right? So maybe they're not doing a great job at getting rid of the bacteria. But what if there was a protocol enacted where they just instructed their residents to, to get a bottle of baking soda water and rinse 10 times throughout the day. It needs to be gone by the end of the day. What if we just kept their mouth neutral throughout the day? Would the effect of the bacteria be as big as a problem? So, so this is 16 ounces of water. Yep. How much, how much baking soda would you put in there? Teaspoon per eight ounces. A teaspoon per eight ounces. It tastes horrible, but this is what I tell people. It tastes a lot better than my dental materials and my dental drill. So keep it in your purse. If you go to the movie and you're drinking a soda pop for the two hours of the movie, you know what? Neutralize your mouth periodic. Take a break. Take a swish and spit it out. Get a cup. Do something. You know, so the, the areas that are going to be problematic if in, a, in an aging institution, if there's a lot of bacteria accumulation, Baking soda is not going to get underneath the surface, so we definitely have to have hygienic kelp. But if they're not doing a great job, simply neutralizing the acid that those bacteria are creating will stop generalized broad decay. The bigger problems for those people in those, those institutions is that they're on medications that inhibit salivary production. They no longer have the, the ability to buffer the acids. So again, baking soda can be a helpful tool. They might be, um, have autoimmune illnesses that have affected their salivary glands. They may be going through chemotherapy that the, the chemistry has affected their salivary glands and now they have dry mouth. Again, it's going to be an, uh, an acid buffering problem. So just initiating some protocols to well, neutralize the mouth. Well, you know why uh, you and I don't have to worry about that? Why? The nursing homes, they're, they're all women. Yeah. In each one of those nursery homes, there's only like one man, and his name was Lucky. <laughs> and uh, my God, um, there's just, I mean, I swear to God, they ought to call them women's homes. Yeah. Uh, the true. average woman in America lives almost five years longer than a man. It's like men are 74, yeah. and women are like 89 and a half. And for the first time in any advanced nation, men's life expectancy has been ticking down yeah. the last two or three years because of the opioid crisis. Yep. Um, and, um, but, um, on that note, man, I hope you make an online C course. Let, let me do one thing, Howard. If people want to find us, they can find us at www.advancedprostheticsinstitute.com. We have a great video library. It's growing. We have a great community there where people can find us. They can find our courses and we can get them out. We can at advancedprostheticsinstitute.com. Yep. Yep. Okay. Advancedprostheticsinstitute.com is the best way to find us. And, uh, you know, we're going to be working to develop some of our social media platforms and, and our out, output. Certainly uh, be watching for us in Dentaltown. I appreciate your invitation to come in there and start sharing some of these protocols. I hope they help our dental community. I hope it gives doctors the tools that they need to really help these people. Give Mark Costas my love. I will do that All for right. sure. And uh, a lot of you guys think Mark Costas is a really happening, hot-looking guy. You know he wears a wig. Uh, start spreading that rumor. Start spreading yeah, that rumor. I will sell definitely. I'm do just that. kidding. Ryan, thanks for working on a Saturday, buddy.